Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone this morning here to worship at the First Presbyterian Church of Everett. We are glad that you are here. Just highlight a couple of announcements. Is it can't hear? Oh, there we go. Okay. Well, good morning. Welcome. We have. A, I'm just going to highlight a couple of announcements as we begin this morning here in worship. Our Thursday Bible study begins this week again. Uh, resumes, I should say. It doesn't begin, but we continue in our book from Brian McLaren called the We Make the Road by Walking. We're in chapter 41, but you don't need to have the book. Uh, the scriptures are in your bulletin. You can follow that Zoom link at 4 o'clock and join us for conversation and study together. A lunch with me, Pastor Allen, is moving to Mondays beginning not this week, but the following week on September 26th, and we'll be meeting in the library. If you're interested in uh, maybe beginning a, a Presbyterian Women Bible study, the Dorcas Circus Circle is beginning to, sorry, that's not very, it might be a circus uh, with, a, with a, the wonderful leadership, but a new circle is uh, reforming and restarting, so if you're interested, please talk to Debbie Roberts or Leslie Sutton about that. Our Poverty 101, which is an Everett Gospel mission, it's a, um, it's a it's a program to learn about poverty and the effects of poverty and homelessness. Uh, it's run by the Everett Gospel Mission. We're hosting that Poverty 101 workshop on Saturday, October 1st. There's still some room to sign up, so use that link in your bulletin or talk with Judy Hammond or John Gebert after worship. Our deacons are planning a Super Sunday, uh, supper, a super Sunday event on October 9th. More information will be coming in our upcoming bulletins. Uh, Sunday school is today from uh, beginning at 1130. It's on the Dead Sea Scrolls in Calvin Lounge, or you can follow the Zoom link. It's been wonderful. I know I've only uh, participated in one, uh, one week, but just a really interesting conversation discussion, so I hope you join us. I'd like to invite Steve Torrance to have a little announcement uh, as we begin, and then we'll have another one by Dottie Vilsbeck. Mine is fairly quick. They have a, a group here today called Common Ground that will be singing here and performing at 3 o'clock, and that's part of the Port Gardner Bay. And something that's important is that um, Darcy Cooper's birthday is Wednesday this week, and even probably more important, this guy turns a year older too. So let's sing happy birthday to him right now. But see, I, I'm not getting better. He is. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God loves you. Happy birthday to you. And that's again part of the reason we left the balloons up. Yeah, for... <laughs> Uh, they're fun to have balloons up no matter what. It's nice to have that. Um, thank you. It is Dottie. Uh, excuse me. Dottie's going to come forward, but I do want to say, I don't, I don't see her here, but Darcy and I are twins, just to let you know. So Dottie's going to tell us about our peace and global witness offering in the month of October. Happy birthday, Alan. Peace of Christ be with you. Isaiah in chapter 55, 12 says... For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The prophet Isaiah also invites us to imagine God's peace in unlikely places. Trees clap their hands. Joy grows where sorrow reigned. A world torn by enmity, strife, and despair blossoms back to abundant life. Lions lie down with lambs. And nations once at war with each other come together in peace. Whenever the church gathers for worship, we are assured of Christ's peace. We celebrate that we are connected, we are loved, and we are not alone. We worship together and are fed from scripture and at Christ's table of peace. After the feast God has prepared for us, we are sent out carrying the joy rekindled in worship and challenged to take the peace of Christ into our world. No matter how large or small the world we inhabit, the joy of God's presence empowers us to live joyfully within our communities and to bring peace to all those that are around us. Peace empowered by joy is at a premium in our world. 
it is difficult to find and even more challenging to maintain. In our polarized world torn by war, famine, and marginalization of the poor and the disenfranchised, we are in desperate need of joyful and brave people willing to ask the hard questions and live the difficult solutions that make peace possible. One person, one situation, one step at a time. As we, as you and I go out into the world in joy and are led forth in peace, we are called to decisive and bold action. We take action today by offering a blessing of our own. Through our participation in the Peace and Global Witness offering, our church is extending Christ's peace throughout our community. We have decided that 25% of the gifts received will stay right here in our community to build God's house alongside Dawson Place. As you may know, Dawson Place is a child advocacy center made up of a group of professionals responding to concerns of child abuse. They are dedicated to helping kids seeking justice and promoting healthy families. 25% will support regional efforts in our Presbytery and 50% will go to the Presbyterian Mission Agency for ministries of education and partnership with active peacemakers all around the world. On World Communion Sunday is the day that we will be receiving our peacemaking offering, which is the first Sunday in October. We will be celebrating the fact that Christ's peace extends throughout all creation. We celebrate that we are all together at the table in God's house. We celebrate that we are offered what we need to continue to work of building the household of God with active peacemakers here at home and around the world. God's peace, empowered by God's joy, reminds us that we are connected to each other. We are not alone. You are not alone. Peace begins with us. Thanks be to God. As I close, I would like to invite you to hold out your hand as I close in prayer. Oh God, you are our peace. Lead us into this world you love so much with the joy that only you can give. Amen. Now, if you're able, let us stand and participate in our call to worship together. It's printed in your bulletin. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time on and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations, and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord, our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dusts and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord.
Amen. Please be seated. As we come to a time of prayer and confession, I just want to highlight a couple of our prayer, prayer requests. First, uh, one that did make our bulletin. Uh, we pray with Tony and Lois for their grandson, Mason. Um, he's having some very serious surgery tomorrow. And so we lift him up and we pray for him and his family for the, for the surgery, for the doctors and the recovery as well. And they, uh, Tony and Lois, bring another update that didn't make this bulletin, uh, but their friend who's on our list, Doug Dawson, he's uh, no longer continuing with chemo. He's on hospice care, and so we will be updating that prayer for next week's bulletin, but we continue to pray for Doug. And also, um, this comes from our dinner at the Bell Crew, specifically from Dottie, but we have a, a man who helps us out weekly. He helps inside with our uh, bathroom monitoring. His name's Don Collins. He is having some heart issues, uh, and he's going to be having potentially some invasive surgery. And uh, so we pray for Don uh, as he thinks about it and is preparing for what might be next for his health. And God knows these needs before we speak, yet our words open our hearts to God's grace. So let us prepare ourselves for God's healing as in words and in silence. And we tell of all that separates us from God and from one another. Please join me as we pray together. Everlasting God, we must confess how we have not lived as your people. We serve many masters, work, wealth, power, addictions, yet not find no help in them. We hear the cries of the poor and shut the doors of our hearts to them. We ridicule those who expose their hopes and dreams to us. This past week, we have taunted our neighbors. Remind us how you treated us to a warm welcome. We may have mocked those who are different than us. Help us to welcome and affirm them as family. We have withheld our compassion and love from others. Remind us of your joy and mercy poured out on all lives. Forgive us, Lord and heal us of our brokenness. Make us well so that by our healing, we might be the hope and love others need in their lives, even as Jesus calls us to be faithful with the grace, peace, and joy entrusted to us. Let us take now a moment in silence to offer our prayers, our joys, concerns, and confessions to God. Trusting that we are God's beloved children, redeemed, forgiven, and set free. We join with believers around the world, praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Just to let everyone know, I know some of you were here last uh, Sunday afternoon, but the summer air, which many in our choir, but also Steve guides, uh, they put on a wonderful choir concert. And so um, we were just continually blessed by the music in this congregation and how it enriches our worship, like on a Sunday morning. So thank you. Our scripture this morning comes from Luke chapter 16, uh, verses 1 through 13. And uh, I know I've encouraged you to bring your Bibles if you have it or pick out a pew Bible in front of you or uh, dig around for a pew Bible. Uh, I'm going to be reading. uh, I put it on my tablet (laughs) so I can blow up the word so I'm not completely squinting. I don't need readers quite yet. They're coming. I know. I can feel it. Uh, But um, I do. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version uh, that I do have my Bible here, but I'm looking on my tablet. This is from Jesus uh, in the Gospel of Luke. And Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him, and that is, he summoned his manager, and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me a counting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, what will I do now that my master is taking this position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as a manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? And the debtor answered, a hundred jugs of olive oil. And he said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 50. Then he asked another, how much do you owe? And he replied, a hundred containers of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and make it 80. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust you to the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We say thanks be to God, and then we might reflect on it and go, well, maybe not this time for this word. I invite you to keep your Bibles open, take notes, follow along, Um, because, you know, before my sabbatical, I tried to sort of write a general theme for what my sermons would fit under this fall, and my notes kept circling around the idea of the basics of faith. However, I struggle personally with the idea that our faith can be pared down to some sort of checklist that, hey, if this is the basic, I check it off and I move on to another. And over the summer, as I reflected on what God was doing in my heart, I kept on coming back to the theme for our year, which is read, pray, love. Reading God's word 
grounds our faith in Jesus. Reading scripture teaches us about God's love that is found in Jesus. It is the basis for how we develop in our prayer and in our acts of service to others. Praying strengthens our relationship with God. When we pray, we seek God's kingdom. We listen for the Holy Spirit. We unburden our lives. We reflect. We struggle with God. And we aim in that to follow Jesus closer. The grace of Christ, the presence of the Spirit and the love of God, which flows into our lives, we then allow to flow out, and we generously love our neighbor and our world. And this fall, our simple grounding focus will be on that theme, read, pray, love. Now, one of the many questions asked to pastors is, well, then where do we start reading the Bible? And at various times, I'm sure we've all done this, we've decided, I'm going to read the Bible cover to cover, and we pick it up, and we begin like any book in the beginning. Yet after a page turning through Genesis and Exodus, we might get bogged down in Leviticus, and most people stall out in Numbers, which is okay. I've been there too. The easier place is to go, well, I'm going to start, and this is true, an easier place to start is in the beginning of the New Testament. But I know plenty of good people who stall out halfway through Romans or somewhere in 1 Corinthians. Now, there are plenty of good reading plans that one can find, but the key is consistency. And I know that there are benefits. I know some people like to read large chunks of scripture to sort of get that large picture. I've come to a place in my own faith journey that I prefer smaller sections where I have an opportunity through prayer and the reflection to maybe dive a little bit deeper for myself. And we, churches and pastors together, plus the many reading plans that are out there, have the option to follow the lectionary. I'm giving you a little bit sort of behind the scenes here. The lectionary is an appointed collection of scripture readings that guide worship on any given day. And if we followed the standard lectionary as a church, then over the course of three years, a cycle of three years, we would have read or looked at about 85% of the entire Bible and then repeat that. So we would be getting this sort of similar things every three years and learning and growing from there. Now, there are gaps, because I said about 85%. There are gaps that are left out, and this has caused many debates. But I'm going to assure you, I'm never going to do a sermon on a genealogy. Some people might. It's just not really my passion. Um, uh, Vicky and I did one of those uh, 23andMe kits a while ago, and I keep all these little notifications. You have more ancestors or more relatives. And I'm like, yeah, okay, great. Uh, like, I know some people are really into genealogy. Um, sorry, Mike. I know you are. Uh, Mike, Mike helped, and Mike back there, Clemens too. I'm, both Mikes helped me remind myself that I'm connected to relatives. Sometimes I'm just not as into it as maybe I should be. So I will never do a sermon on genealogy right now. Next week, I'll probably do it. No, just kidding. <laughs> but, you know, that's part of that's left out. But this, this gap in the lectionary has caused debates. And so in response, there are narrative lectionaries. There are letter lectionaries. There are full scripture lectionaries. And they all have their pros and cons. But I tell you this because every week, I look at the lectionary for a given Sunday, and I use it to choose the verses that guide our worship. I just don't, um, unless I tell you that we're in a specific sermon series, um, or, or maybe if I tell you differently, then you should know with high certainty that I chose our verses on a Sunday, not just at random, but from a list that guides the larger church through God's word. And just in case you were wondering, if you were to ask me where to start, I would say, Pick a gospel and read it, and then read after that, read the Sermon on the Mount, and then read all of Jesus' parables. Because I'm sure you've heard this before, but many of my mentors have told me this, and they got this from other people. If we just spent time learning and applying Jesus' good news, the grace of his resurrection, if we followed his sermons, his parables, then this world would be a lot better place for all of us. But I use the lectionary for today, and the long, rambling thing, because I'm in a pickle. And, you know, because we're teaching from a parable, so I'm checking off these little boxes in my mind. This parable is not easy. 
I'm thinking, how did this make the lectionary? Our verses are about money and a dishonest manager being celebrated. Did you catch that? person who's dishonest is being honored. Oh, why did I pick this one? So one of the skills of reading scripture and preparing the sermon, but for all of us as we read God's word, is to look what came before and after our verses and sort of get where is this located. And our text follows the parable of the prodigal son, which is in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. And if you remember that prodigal son, it's about money. It's about being lost and found. It's about squandering. And this story comes right before the story of the rich man and Lazarus, which is in verses 19 through 31. We're going to look at that next week, just so you can be preparing. And that's a story about money, about a rich man, and about a beggar out in front. Jesus is on a roll here teaching about money. I mean, that verse in, th um, you know, just to let you know, that verse squandered in verse 1, in 16, verse 31, in verse 16, chapter 16, verse 1, the verb that's there, squandered, is also used to describe that the younger son squanders the wealth in 15, verse 13. So if you had your Bibles open, you could be looking at those words, right? Okay, just as a note, you can do that while I preach. Jesus warns us in verse 13 that we cannot serve both God and wealth. Jesus has money on his mind through the prodigal son, these verses, and the rich man and Lazarus. So we need a sample Snoop Dogg here because we can all agree we know what it's like to have our mind on our money and our money on our mind, right? Oh, my goodness. I'm dating my... I see a couple of people laugh. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'll just give you this brief other little sample. We went into a surf shop in Ventura, and we were asking about their rental policy for surfboards and wetsuits. They had our sizes because I'm tall and, and Peyton and Vicky are a little bit shorter. And, and so they find that sometimes surf shops don't have your size. We got our correct sizes. And then we asked, how much is the daily rental? And the response was $50 a day for the board and $50 a day for the wetsuit. And Vicky immediately said, what? <laughs> we paid $25 a day in Santa Cruz just the other day. And this surfer guy, so I always love going to surfer shops because, you know, the surfer guy at the counter, he did a little double take, right? And he responded, well, we're closer to L.A. <laughs> we rented from another company in the morning, just to let you know. Because we understand, all of us, we're all careful about our money. We stress out about our money. It's on our minds. We want to know if we're doing the right thing with our money. And we're especially keen when we learn that someone is cheating, when someone is dishonest, when those who are living off our hard-earned and worked money, when they get a chance to be taken down a peg or two, then we get excited. And Jesus begins this parable, but he throws this bizarre thing into our knee-jerk reaction about, yeah, this dishonest manager is going to get his due. Jesus says, hmm, well, this manager, when he realized he's going to get fired, the manager realizes he's not going to survive a day laboring, digging in the fields. He needs to find friends really quick. And he comes up with this plan. He says, all right. He brings in these debtors. He says, how much do you owe? And he has them change their bills. He reduces by 50%, by 20%. And here comes the confusing part because we think, okay, he's going to get caught now. He's going to get caught now. This rich man, he approves of this. He commends the manager for his shrewd actions. And why would the master commend the manager for bringing in less money? Now, some commentaries and theologians explain that, look it, we would have to have a whole course in economics of first world, uh, I mean, first century world politics there. But a lot of these um, explanations and, and ex, you know, wrestling said that well, maybe the master prayed him, praised him because the master understands Deuteronomy 23, 19, and 20, which forbids charging interest. And I'll just read it really quick. Deuteronomy 23, 19, and 20. You shall not charge interest on loans to another Israelite. Interest on money, interest on provisions, interest on anything that is lent. That's what 
Deuteronomy says in chapter 23. So maybe master praised that. Maybe the manager cut the debts by forfeiting his own commission, which means that he actually marked up what everyone owed and he cut it down. So the master gets his full return and this manager actually gets a little break, maybe making friends. So when he's kicked out, he has friends in the business. Yet others have suggested more generally that the employer, this master, is simply commending the manager for responsibly being shrewd in difficult circumstances. Because that word for shrewd could be also translated as prudent or wise. No matter how we choose to interpret it, the manager's debt reduction is praised. And this does not make sense. We want those who are dishonest to be punished, to go to jail, to repay those who are ripped off, to at least be made a fool. But this is what makes Jesus' parables so amazing, as they call us to read them, to sit with them, to wonder about what God is saying through his word. Jesus invites us to follow him through this message. I mean, through this parable, excuse me. We continue to seek God's message and to read and ponder, and we see some maybe ideas in verses 8 through 13. First, if we thought, if we look there in verse 16, verse 8, Jesus says, the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the children of light. In other words, Jesus' disciples, we, who are often referred to as children of light, we could learn something about acting prudently from the children of this age. And second, what could we learn from this children of this age? has to do something with making friends for themselves by means, Jesus says, of dishonest wealth so that those might friends might welcome them into the eternal homes. Instead of using dishonest wealth to exploit others as the corrupt and dishonest do, going back to Deuteronomy, rather than using dishonest wealth to exploit others, maybe use wealth to make friends, to be able to see ourselves in a way that would utilize wealth, utilize our resources to make friends rather than harm each other. Third, Jesus points out that there's a connection to being faithful or dishonest with very little and with very much. How one deals with dishonest things and what belongs to another says just as much as how we will deal with true riches or what is our own. How we use the resources at our disposal in this life, especially in tight circumstances, maybe with wealth, I mean, with wealth or time, matters even though our true riches can only be found in one place. Luke tells us in verse 12, in chapter 12, verses 33 and 34, our true riches can be found where no thief can draw near or moth destroy. Our true riches are found in God alone. Finally, we're told in verse 13 that no slave can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and wealth. This reiterates a central theme in the gospel of Luke. And that theme is the kingdom of God entails giving up all other commitments, including our commitment to economic security, to follow Jesus. From the very beginning of Luke's account, emphasis on place on how the reign of God reverses and is reversing what we normally think rules in this world. Just think about Mary's song from the birth narrative, which is found in chapter 1, 51 through 63. Also, if we think about how Luke also wrote Acts, where there's a huge tie-in with the Acts of the Apostles, the Christian community is one where disciples share all things in common, distributing to all as any had in need, which is in Acts chapter 2, 44 through 45. You can flip there if you want to look. These texts and the way Jesus is using this parable just cannot be spiritualized. Luke is talking about a different way of using the wealth and the resources in our lives. Our wealth, our resources, our time, our talents belong to God and are to be used for the purposes of God's kingdom among us, not simply for our own interests. I mean, this dishonest manager, even though he is still a sinner who is looking out for his own interests, He models behavior that we as disciples can emulate. Instead of being a victim of circumstances, he transforms a bad situation into one that benefits him and others through this debt reduction. He creates, even in this weird way, he creates by reducing this debt a new set of relationship 
He enters a new relationship with them, not just between this master and a slave, and this, you know, this idea of one who loans and one who's in debt, but this manager changes it into a relationship of friends, being more egalitarian. He reminds us in this parable what happens when the reign of God emerges among us, that these old hierarchies are overturned and new relationships can be established. If our friendships, if our relationships are only based on what you can do for each other, a zero-sum game, it's only about reciprocal, I bought you a gift, you buy me a gift, this one-on-one, then we're never going to understand God's amazing grace, which is given to us freely. When we release each other away from debts and we free each other up from social structures that only enrich ourselves by connections, we develop a new relationship with each other. We find ourselves that we're free to be who we are with each other. We're loved by each other. And we find grace because we, re- we remove each other from this one-on-one, have to do or live or exist with each other. That's done by grace. We might be able to see in that moment God's kingdom, God's reversal, God's love being manifest here on earth. Jesus is not calling out the rich. He's not, instead, he's calling out our loyalties. Where are our loyalties put? Are they in God or are they in other things? Are our loyalties found in things that enable us to enrich each other? Or are our loyalties found in ways in which we tear each other down? When our loyalties are out of kilter, it's awfully hard to be imaginative, to see God around us to see each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. We get this challenge when we read Scripture. When we read Scripture, we are aware of the complexity of Jesus' call on our lives. It doesn't mean that we have to like get down and complicate things or fret things, but it frees us up that God's love is continually transforming us, that God speaks through God's Word when we read it. And we are challenged to link scripture with scripture and not be swayed by easy platitudes or be swept along with what everyone else is doing, but it grounds us that as followers of Christ, we look and act and exist in a different way. Reading connects us to the body of Christ where we are learning to care for each other and we follow God's plan for our world. And in turn, we pray. Praying releases us from doing life as we've always been doing it, And it allows us to expand in grace where we are redeemed and live for God. And as we do that, we find God's love pouring into our lives and we love Jesus. And then that calls us to love our neighbor where we risk seeing each other as sisters and brothers united in Christ, not divided by things like wealth or status. Friends, we are called to read, to pray, and to love. When we do that, we can see God using Jesus' words to transform our lives into deeper and more meaningful relationships. Amen. Now as you're able, let us stand and sing our closing hymn.
Amen. Two things popped into my brain right before, or right at the, uh, right at the end of this sermon. First is that if you are able to help uh, support Jimmy uh, this Wednesday with volunteers at Dinner at the Bell, please speak with him. We need a couple of volunteers for Dinner at the Bell this Wednesday. Also, we're celebrating Liz Lombard's life on Saturday, uh, the 24th at 1 p.m. right here. Uh, some of us knew and remember Liz and Larry. Uh, she died earlier this year, and we're going to be having a memorial for Celebrate Her Life at 1 o'clock right here on Saturday. But friends, let's go from here, knowing that as we read God's word, we are challenged to follow him closely. and We find ourselves giving up those things that cloud our vision that prevent us from loving him. Let us go, friends, with the love of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Guide us and be with us always. Amen.